12 Step Recovery Procedures, Volume 4, Corporate Democratic Spirituality. Just what is corporate democratic spirituality? Well, the order of these three words can be interchanged in various ways. Democratic corporate spirituality, spiritual corporate democracy, democratic spiritual corporation, and so on. But essentially, I use them to refer to a paradigm created by the life work of Bill Wilson. The Bill Wilson I'm talking about was a former army officer who became a drunk in the New York City stock market arena in the 1920s, but eventually became the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. First, he developed the 12-step method for obtaining sobriety, sanity, and becoming spiritually and morally awake, based upon his experience with Dr. Silkworth at the town's hospital from the procedures used by the Christian Oxford group in New York City and from working altruistically trying to teach his method to others. He wrote the book Alcoholics Anonymous to describe how the method is to be used and to provide many testimonies of personal experiences in using the 12-step method to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind, often referred to as incomprehensible demoralization. It is pretty obvious that the term incomprehensible demoralization has something to do with a person's lack of morals and their inability to recognize that their moral quality correlates with their capacity to enjoy life. Bill refers to it through his own personal experience as a seemingly hopeless state of mind. Through my own personal experience, I have observed that this seemingly hopeless state of mind induced by the decline of one's morals and spiritual conduct can reoccur frequently throughout one's life without ever consuming any alcohol or mind-altering drugs. Therefore, as Mr. Wilson's directions state, the 12-step method is not a plan that can be finished and done with. To prevent the reoccurrence of the hopeless state of mind, the 12-step method must become a way of life. The challenges contained in its principles can keep any human being striving for as long as they live. One cannot outgrow the 12-step method of maintaining a spiritually awake state of mind. We must allow for unlimited expansion. Retrogression can spell death or suicide. As people began to succeed with the 12-step process, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous began to formulate ever so slowly. Bill consistently pressed forward with many attempts to bring his method of elevating one's consciousness to a spiritually enlightened state of mind to the attention of the pu general public, as well as employers and families of suffering alcoholics. Eventually, his organization called Alcoholics Anonymous grew exponentially to its present size. Bill developed his organization as a corporation and with a board and charter, having the newly developing meetings responding somewhat liberally to the foundation board and its central office in New York City for direction. Bill acted as the chief executive officer. He also established a publishing company for his instruction book with the same name, Alcoholics Anonymous, and he sold stock in it. With the increase in size of his fellowship, it became necessary to establish some open-minded but practical rules for social conduct during the meetings so that harmony and the primary purpose of the organization could be maintained. This format became the 12 Traditions, which also included suggestions to prevent disharmony and disruption of the primary purpose, which was to learn, work through, and then carry the 12-step procedures to help others. Then, at the death of his co-founder, Dr. Robert Smith, medical doctor, and realizing his own mortality, Bill developed a democratic system for all the groups throughout the U.S. and Canada. 
so that they could communicate the needs of the membership to the corporate board. Later, a world corporation, AA World Service, was developed for its globally expanding altruistic program to help persons suffering from the disease of alcoholism and from a seemingly hopeless state of mind called incomprehensible demoralization. Bill later developed another set of common sense and practical guidelines for the democracy and corporation, which he entitled the 12 Concepts and Warranties. These bylaws were to be followed so that the representatives of the democracy and the employees of the corporation would act on sound spiritual, moral, and prudent principles concerning the policies govern governing the overall organization and its membership. To get an idea of the present size of AA, just Google Alcoholics Anonymous and look up the schedule for current meetings of AA in your present area. See that there are many meetings every day at many locations during various times of the day. Perhaps attend one to see that there can be anywhere from 10 to 100 or more people in attendance. Then look at the meeting schedule for a major city near you to see that the number of meetings increase significantly. Then imagine the number of meetings that must be occurring daily across the United States. Next, include Mexico and Canada in this calculation. Now realize that AA is a world organization. The actual size of the membership of AA is incalculable. But you can tell from this illustration that it has a similar tendency as would many religious organizations such as Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhism, Masons, and so forth. Bill Wilson had a military academy education and after World War I dabbled in law, business, economics, and the stock market. So that later in his life, when he began to develop his organization to help people recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind using his 12-step method, he chose and used the ideas of corporate administration as the most effective method of management to develop the foundation for, of his organization. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous has always been a corporation. Therefore, I use the term corporate in my description of Bill Wilson's paradigm, the model he developed for the operation and administration of AA. Many other 12-step fellowships have also developed and grown over the years using Bill Wilson's paradigm. I am always suggesting to my readers that many of the design principles of Bill Wilson's paradigm can be integrated into business or spiritual corporations because that is what Bill was known for on Wall Street before he succumbed to the progressive degeneration from the disease of alcoholism. In the beginning of Bill's stock market advisory career, he physically visited businesses and corporations to evaluate the effectiveness of their administration, their management of personnel, and their activities to determine their potential for success and longevity. A satisfactory evaluation gave Bill a relative idea of the company's marketability on the New York stock market. Later, Bill used his early experience of understanding business and corporations when it came to designing his own organization, the Fellowship of AA, into a corporation devised for success and longevity. To date, the AA Corporation has met and surpassed Bill's plans and goals. When Bill Wilson decided to step down as CEO, he still left the board of Alcoholics Anonymous in place with some, ma with some minor changes. But he also developed a democracy for his rapidly expanding fellowship so that the needs of the membership could be expressed to the board and corporate administration of AA. Bill created a representative 
in hierarchical democracy. A member of a group would attend the next level of the assembly, usually at the level of state, to vote on proposed actions and petitions to be taken for various administrative issues. The decisions made by the general consensus of each state assembly would be brought forth to the national conference by their elected state, province, com or commonwealth, and so on, delegate. Being from Vermont, Bill included Canada as well as the U.S. into this democratic system. However, this new system for democracy contradicted his earlier creation of providing an enormous amount of autonomy to the group with very little guidance except for the 12 traditions and the 12 steps. What previously had taken place was that the meaning of exactly what was a group became ambiguous and convoluted. Some individual meetings call themselves a group and remain autonomous from other AA activities. Some meeting halls with many and various meetings throughout the day called themselves a group and remained autonomous from the meetings and meeting halls of other locations. Yet still, other meetings and meeting halls established an inner group with a central office to accommodate and administrate the needs of the local AA activities. The disparity increased and divided from urban to rural areas where often special needs of the minority became neglected to satisfy the demands of the majority. Intergroup boards are often established and through their ignorance of the corporation's spiritual and democratic precepts run more like tribunals than a democracy. Private deals are made in back rooms totally disrespecting minority points of view and ignoring their own intergroup bylaws. Yes, there is corruption in AA as well. Spiritual and moral issues are put to the wayside for expedience and to satisfy mob peer pressure. Many see the power to be had and entirely skip the 12-step process to directly enter into the field of service. But it is much more like self-service with the campaign cry of, look how humble we are at the work we are doing for service for others while they eat cake and cookies. And often the person that has placed genuine humility, morality, and spirituality as their number one priority are squashed by the mob, tarred and feathered, and chased out of the fellowship. When Bill's democracy for the fellowship of AA was ratified by a representative body of the membership and put into place in 1955, no changes were made to the piecemeal organizational establishment of AA that was already in place, thereby allowing for some future problems of communication, span of control, and duplication of effort. However, despite the dark side of AA, the fellowship is also made up of many dedicated persons providing altruistic service without any financial compensation for their activities. In most issues where contingencies arise, the spirit of cooperation usually overcomes the predicament. The overall direction of the fellowship, when brought to task, can eventually admit to their ignorance and errors and follow their corporation's instituted moral and spiritual principles in order to correct their previous irrational mistakes that they made in the heat of frenzy. But nevertheless, this omission could present problems with corporate administration as well as problems with clear communication from the body of members to the corporate board if someone were to copy the corporate democratic spirituality design from AA in its entirety. Therefore, in my description of a corporate democratic spirituality system, I often depart from the original and actual democratic and corporate system of AA in the present to a more theoretically pure abstract 
in order to avoid the problems that could occur between the actual AA levels of intergroup and state assembly format. However, many of the ideas presented in this brief discussion could easily be expanded or selective parts chosen and adapted for business and corporation needs without buying into the total package. Conversely, though, I am personally an all or none personality, and I have never bought into the cliche, take what you need and leave the rest. I found the cliche to be a half measure that usually leads to failure. So with that in mind, I will continue with my explanation of how I interpret Bill Wilson's paradigm in which I call a corporate democratic spirituality. Hopefully by now the reader has already reviewed and practiced the information provided in my presentations entitled 12 Step Recovery Procedures, Volumes 1 through 3. But if this is the first time you're exposed to my YouTube or LinkedIn presentations, the term spirituality that I define in this document encompasses all forms of spiritual and moral development as explained in my previous literature. Obviously, the term is subjective, and each and every one is entitled to their own opinions and concepts. But the main issue with the definition of spirituality in these writings is that spirituality must always be progressive, growing and expanding, and is to never be left dormant or allowed to regress. And since the term spirituality is the noun of the title package, this implies that spirituality must be the fundamental priority, always being the footing for all corporate and democratic activities within the paradigm. Finally, the term spirituality in reference to my description of the Bill Wilson paradigm must always include morality, moral actions, moral thoughts, and so on within its definition. Again, I can interchange these three terms depending upon the point I wish to make. Since AA was first a spiritual program, then a corporation, and then a democracy, I could refer to it as a spiritual corporate democracy or as a democratic corporate spirituality, depending upon which came first in the development of the fellowship or which is the most current. In this article, which will become the next volume, volume four, in my series of 12-step recovery procedures, I use the term corporate democratic spirituality because in the previous volumes, volumes one through volume three, I initially described the spirituality aspect, which is in volume one, which is the basis of the entire program. I then explained the system for democracy in volume two, beginning at the business meeting level, and then using those moral, spiritual, and democratic methods, I described the hierarchical democratic assemblies to be used within the Bill Wilson paradigm. I used the adjective democratic to describe this democratic program of spirituality. I also entitled the spiritual fellowship with the acronym HSP, which stands for higher spiritual power. The corporation is the last aspect I described, but it is no less than the democracy. As the size of the spiritual fellowship grows and an effective administrative and management system must be put into place or atrophy and anarchy could prevail, tearing down the walls of everything previously built up. The corporation must have authority, but the word authority must not be feared. Authority can be a moral, spiritual, as well as benign. This is the type of authority that must be instilled by the corporate administration of a spiritual fellowship. Therefore, the term corporate is also an adjective used to describe the spiritual fellowship's method of administration and management. 
The democracy is established so that the membership can communicate their needs in a moral and spiritual manner to the corporation. And the corporation is established to administrate and satisfy those needs of the membership in a moral and spiritual manner. Bill Wilson uses, used an inverted pyramids illustration to depict that the membership is always the highest level in the hierarchy, similar to the theory that the electorate and the citizen are the highest ranking individuals in a democracy. However, this is just a metaphor to illustrate a rather passionate and zealous point. The concept of moral spirituality must always be the highest priority. Above the membership, individual members, the democracy, or the corporation. Actually, the corporation CEO and board must have authority to administrate the overall organizational policies and goals over the national, state, central, and group offices or otherwise the organization would be paralyzed with indecision, disorder, and perhaps rebellion. The hierarchical democracy has been set up to ratify suggested organizational policies and procedures and membership petitions. Besides being the representative delegate to vote on these issues, the elected group representative acts as the liaison to communicate the general needs of the membership to the corporation and convey the overall corporate administrative policies to the membership. Although the membership and their democracy petition and ratify, the ultimate authority for administration, action, funding, and practically, practicality must lie within the corporate CEO. Most of the rules and guidelines for corporate democratic spirituality have already been presented in volume two, Start Your Own Support Group. However, I provide a narrative explanation of the paradigm with a little bit different description of the structure of corporate dem democratic spirituality in this volume four as well. I could start with the meeting structure first as I did in volume two, but I think it's best in this volume to start at the corporate office level describing a system similar to the way A began. Volume 2 explains a method of starting your own support group and then slowly expanding exponentially outward until you have developed the central office for the local meetings, later a state office, an assembly, and then eventually a national conference, national office, corporate board, and CEO. Another way to start a corporate democratic spirituality other than starting a meeting is to create the corporate office first and then set up a program to start meetings throughout the U.S. Naturally, this second method would require a bankroll to begin with, but I provide this idea for anyone reading this material that might just be wanting to adopt some of the principles of a corporate democratic spirituality only. As previously mentioned, the corporate democratic spirituality system should be alert to cultural differences between different areas, such as between urban and rural. However, it is never advised to create meetings exclusive to one particular ethnic, gender, profession, and so forth. Once a person has met the prerequisites of one, the necessary review initiation of volume one, two, having a mentor, and three, when attending meetings, stating their intentions before participating in activity discussions. The meetings and organizational system should always strive to be inclusive to all cultures of people, always respecting the minority opinion as equal to the majority opinion. Naturally, my preference is the former method as described in volume two, but actually creating either system is pretty much hypothetical at this point. 
So let me hypothesize. Suppose a corporation with a board is created somewhere, let's say Washington, D.C. I used this idea in another book entitled Word of Mouth Democracy for the 99% to create a hypothetical organization based upon these spiritual and organizational principles and use the design to eventually compete with other special interest lobbyist groups and to lobby Congress for greater consideration for morality in their decision-making processes in creating our national laws and the policies for government administration. So this hypothetical corporation hires a CEO to set up a national office and hire staff. This office trains personnel in the spiritual process and practices set forth in volume one, the meeting and business meeting system of volume two, the mentoring method of volume three. The corporate office then pays them to set up an office in each state capital, which in turn trains more personnel to create a central office in various geographical areas of that state. The local central offices could then divide their geographical area into different groups pertaining to that geographical area of demographics and then train people to set up meetings throughout each group area. Advertising campaigns could be addressed to the group areas to attract attendees to the meetings set up at various times and locations. Once the meetings start to gather a significant number of attendees, the corporation could begin supporting itself. At this point, the democracy could be established. Naturally, business meetings for each existing meeting would start to handle the needs of the attendees and allow the attendees to participate in the chores necessary to conduct meetings and business meetings. Each business meeting could select a group representative to attend the group assembly and represent their meeting's needs. Likewise, that representative could be a person to inform the business meeting and meeting attendees of the consensus made by the democracy and the policies enacted by the corporation. Besides the prerequisites to be a member of a support group and a voting member of the business meeting, there should be some thought and consideration into the selection process of electing a group representative. That person should have at least the respect of the other members and should have performed as chairman, secretary, or treasurer with the meeting or business meeting. One of the reasons of the importance of having the respect of the other members is that the group representative will require a lot of volunteer assistance from other members of the business meeting. That elected representative will require the help of many other members for various projects, attending and documenting committee meetings, and other democratic and corporate activities that the group representative might not be able to accommodate individually. Also, there should always be an alternate group representative chosen by the group representative or the assembly to stand in as needed. The group assembly can elect a delegate from their participants to attend the central office democratic assembly. And likewise, the central office assembly chooses a state delegate. And finally, the state assembly chooses a national delegate. And again, some effort and determination must be exhibited by the Democratic Assembly to choose qualified delegates and to provide a system for fair and adequate compensation and reimbursement for the delegates time, industry and travel. The delegates will need alternates and a good staff of volunteers from the assembly they are representing. The democracy is designed to address any and all petitions of members and to pass on to the corporation their decisions, findings, and recommendations. The corporation in turn responds to the membership and their democ democracy's decisions, findings, and recommendations with corporate administrative policies and actions to provide for a smooth moral and spiritual functioning of the organization and satisfaction for the membership.
Naturally, issues that pertain only to a particular meeting can be resolved by their business meeting. Other issues may be passed up the democratic hierarchy and can be resolved at the most appropriate level that would satisfy the affected memberships. On the other hand, each corporate office will have a manager and staff on payroll. However, member volunteers will always be welcomed and appreciated. Each office level could handle the administration of their democratic assembly's decisions that do not require elevation to the next hierarchical democratic assembly. Also, each office would be responsible to the next echelon of corporate office as well. Each office level could be the impetus and overseer for the democratic assembly activities. They would also be the leading unit behind the arrangement of other activities for the fellowship, such as educational conferences, conventions, meditation groups, picnics, dances, and so forth, to ensure that the financial concerns and handling of these activities meet corporate policies. The corporate board can also establish subsidiaries, such as a publishing company, so that the literature needs of the membership can be readily attended to. The overall corporation and its literature must be adaptable and alive, and the board must always be willing to make adjustments to meet the current needs of the membership. Other 12-step subsidiary corporations for special needs such as certain addictions or obsessive compulsive disorders, examples are uh, anger or eating or sex and so forth, that could be easily discussed, that could not be easily discussed by the diverse members in the established support group could be set up nationally as well. Obviously, there are many, many more concerns and issues that must be attended to, but I am keeping the description brief for this document. I have provided much more extensive material in other books I have prepared. I would suggest reading The Bill Wilson Paradigm if you have any further interest in this subject, but generally it is very dull reading and very few people besides myself enjoy getting lost in the design of organizational bylaws or charters. What I have provided should at least establish a basic blueprint for anyone with a desire to follow Bill Wilson's paradigm and start such an organization. And understandably, there is much more to it than what a layman such as myself could possibly present to professional businessmen and attorneys with far superior education and experience in these matters. But I am sure that there are some nuggets of great value in this brief description of what I've provided. However, my minimum exposure to business convinced me of one thing. Employee morale is a very key element to the successful operation of that business. By having the basic tenants participate in a system designed for democratic decision making and by providing an avenue for the proletariat to communicate to the corporation goes a long way in maintaining worker morale. Employees won't have to feel that they have given up all their rights provided to them under the U.S. Constitution just for a paycheck. If no corporate route is designed for employees to communicate with management, then they will design their own manipulative, clandestine, and sometimes subversive communication channels. My hope is that this information may provide useful to those interested in the topic. Perhaps the perspective presented in this volume may assist those in administrative and delicate positions in other 12-step or spiritual organizations. In the performance of service for others, it is often easy to become lost and not be able to see the forest because of the trees that are in the way. It is often necessary to get back to reviewing basic blueprints so that you can remember what the original design was for. Ego is a subtle, cunning, and treacherous foe. Without the continuous help and guidance through meditation and prayer, with your own personal concept of a higher spiritual power, and the support of like-minded people 
on the same path of moral and spiritual development, your chances of overcoming ego are slim to none.